So why is it so hard to imagine what the world will be like if we all end up with indefinite lifespan or, you know, living forever, biological immortality? Many people have pointed out in the comments that uh, on a long enough timeline, something's going to get you. There's either going to be an accident or violence um, or the, the rare diseases that we either can't cure or don't catch soon enough. Basically, there's always something that's going to kill you. And as some people comically point out, uh, <laughs> on a long enough timeline, the heat death of the universe will get to you. But dialing back the, uh, the perspective to centuries or millennia, which so far as I know, except for maybe some vampires out there in the audience, no human has really experienced living for centuries or millennia. That change alone would have profound impacts on every aspect of the human experience, from the life cycle, from the rate at which we have children, to politics and economics, to the organization of society. Now, we've explored this some in various works of fiction, uh, most recently and most famously, I think, being Altered Carbon, where the Methuselahs, or the Meths, are people that are rich enough to live forever. And not only uh, do they not age, they even have backups of their brains and spare bodies. So it's literally impossible to kill them. Because uh, you can nuke one of them from orbit, they'll just spin up another copy. Is that possible? Personally, I don't see a pathway to that technology. You also have to make a lot of assumptions about consciousness. And so like, okay, you spin up a copy, it's just a copy. The original you is gone. Just like how transporters might work. Anyways, going down a rabbit hole. My point for today's video is I just wanted to unpack, like, what are the immediate changes, assuming that we start getting some rejuvenation therapies here soon? Now, thanks to my Patreon community, they pointed out that there's actually a, um, a breakthrough treatment that is currently going through clinical trials in Japan, or it's about to start clinical trials. This is a mitochondrial rejuvenation therapy. Now, just taking a guess, because obviously the science isn't out yet, um, and I'm not a molecular biologist, but everything that I know about aging, having read and listened to a bunch of the, uh, the big longevity people and rejuvenation people, a tremendous amount of our aging actually comes from mitochondrial uh, decay. So if you can rejuvenate every powerhouse of every cell, that is the fundamental workhorse of human metabolism. That means every tissue works better, every organ works better, all healing works better. And so my, a question from my community, which is why I decided to make this video, was like, what does this do? And if it does get approved in Japan, even if it's only marginally effective, because it's like, okay, it's not like in an ideal world, your mitochondria would all go back to, you know, day zero, right? Like firstborn, your mitochondria are, you know, working at 120%. We might not get that, at least not with the first version of this treatment. Um, there could also be side effects, but let's just imagine that this treatment works and it increases your mitochondrial function by, let's say you, you get 25% back or 50% back. Um, so like, basically if you're age 50, you get about 12 and a half years back of youth um, or up to 25 years of youth. Now, I don't know a single 50 year old who would not love to have the energy and vigor that they had at 32 or 25. Hell, I'm only 38 and I wanna be 32 again. So imagine that that happens. What happens next? Because the question is, how long is it gonna to take to get approved in America and Europe and so on? So one thing that's gonna happen is medical tourism. As soon as that drug is available, if you have enough money, you can go to Thailand, you can go to Singapore, you can go to Japan, and you can get that treatment there. Now, of course, that feeds directly into that whole altered carbon world where only the rich get the treatments. But I suspect that so long as this medication is cheap enough to mass produce, it will probably get breakthrough status. So breakthrough status is something, I don't know how it works uh, specifically, and I'm pretty sure every nation has their own different version, but the FDA here in America has what's called a breakthrough status. Um, and there's, there's various criteria. I remember looking it up during uh, the pandemic, actually. 
because the COVID vaccines had breakthrough status. And so the idea is breakthrough status is granted to medications that are novel um, and offer significant advantage to either improving quality of life or treating as yet untreated diseases. So if you think of mitochondrial aging as a disease, we don't have any treatments for it. Nothing that is clinically approved or, or approved. So if it gets breakthrough status, it gets fast-tracked, which means it, get, it gets moved to the front of the line on clinical trials, the data gets prioritized, and in some cases, uh, and don't quote me on this because again, um, I'm probably saying it wrong, but basically the threshold of getting approved is lower or faster at least. So I suspect if this medication pans out in Japan, and Japan has a pretty robust, like their, their scientists are really good, they're world class. So if Japan figures out mitochondrial rejuvenation first or whoever, you're <laughs> gonna see a huge gold rush, by the way. Uh, Moderna, um, every other, you know, Pfizer, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, all of them are gonna start pouring resources into this because the proof of concept is there. So this is one thing that happens, particularly here in America, is that while they're constantly looking for novel classes of drugs, the research costs that go into finding novel drugs is in the billions and billions of dollars, and many of them don't pan out. So this whoever's doing this in Japan, they'll get first mover advantage, but by forging the way, by proving that it can be done, you're gonna have a lot of copycats. And where there's, you know, you, you look at how, um, how much money there is to be made on the weight loss drugs like Wagovi right now and all those other ones, uh, yeah, you better believe that if it's like, oh, hey, take this pill and you're suddenly 10 to 20 years younger, uh, yeah, that's going to sell. <laughs> that's going to sell like, like hotcakes. And uh, so there's going to be a gold rush. There's going to be fast-tracked approvals. And so, you know, uh, just about, what, six months ago? I, I echoed uh, Ray Kurzweil, who said we're on track for a longevity escape velocity by 2030. Yeah, this is it. This is what it looks like. Because you hit mitochondria, and again, that underpins your entire metabolism. Every single cell of your body. If you can rejuvenate that part of every cell, that is going to make a huge difference in your blood chemistry, your organ function, your brain function. God, like, it's difficult to imagine what that's going to do. Now... The biggest question is, how expensive is it to make? That is the single biggest question, because if it is cheap enough to mass produce, then you basically uh, incentivize, you subsidize the production of it so that it's as cheap as aspirin, so that it's as cheap as many other drugs. You know, one of the prescriptions I'm on costs $3 a month, and it's not even subsidized. Um, or maybe it is subsidized, I don't know. It's only $3 a month, life-saving medication. Um, yeah. So what is that going to do to society though? If suddenly you know that you've got another 20 years of youthfulness, well, this isn't going to be the last drug. So there's going to be more therapies that come out in that next 20 years. And so the dominoes just keep falling. You get those compounding returns and those snowball effects. So basically my assertion in, uh, in my community discord was, yeah, like AI plus longevity escape velocity that should be the macroeconomic policy of the entire world. Um, and so there's a, there's a tremendous incentive. So I know a lot of people are very skeptical about the wealthy and the powerful elites. If something is expensive, they get it. But it wouldn't really behoove the elites to just keep it for themselves. Um, I know that that's how a lot of things look, especially if they're too expensive. And they might try and use regulatory capture to milk it for all it's worth. But something this big, like... There would be riots in the streets if people tried to keep it from us. Um, so what happens next? Well, suddenly, you know that you've got the rest of eternity, or at least the next few centuries. Oop, about fell into the river there. Um, that you've got the next few centuries to do everything that you want to achieve. Whether it's have children, whether it's write a book. So everything slows down. Everything is like, well, you know, I got all the time in the world. What's the rush? So a lot of people are going to get off the grind because then it's like, well, I know I'm going to be healthy, more or less, as long as I can eat, as long as I can just stay alive. And people ask me, like, Dave, what's your policy? And I'm like, just don't die for the next 10 years. Like, that's it. Like, do the bare minimum to stay alive and healthy for the next 10 years. And after that, you're probably golden. Um, 
So then it's like, okay, well, we have children more slowly, so that solves population problem. Oh, and by the way, I know a lot of people are still concerned about like the Malthusian trap and population bomb and all that fun stuff, but we've already solved that and we've solved it through social policy and that is namely equality before the law. Uh, women are now uh, in, more in control of their own bodies, although the Republicans are trying to erase that. <clears throat> Just look at the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, but with more control over their own bodies and their own economic destinies, women choose to have fewer children. Uh, population or uh, birth rates are going down globally in every developed nation. So overpopulation is not the problem. It, and even if you say like, oh, well, everyone's gonna live forever, isn't that gonna like become another problem? No, because then it's like, even for the women who want to have children, it's probably gonna be like one, maybe two, and then you're done. You don't ever need to do it again. Um, now, will some women choose to continue having children forever because they love having children? Sure. It's not gonna be a majority though, I don't think. Um, and so kind of like uh, <clears throat> speculating way far into the future using science fiction and fantasy and stuff, the way that I imagine it'll play out, like let's just imagine a thousand years from now, most people will choose not to have children. Um, and even those that do, like let's say, you know, only 25% of people choose to have children. Of those that do, most are only gonna have a handful. Some will continue having children, but the birth rate overall is gonna be so low, and the death rate is also gonna be overall so low that the population will more or less plateau and stabilize. But of course, all of this comes back to the assumption that these rejuvenation medicines are effective and cheap. But again, even if the first one is only 20% effective, that's just the first one. Like once, it op once you open up an entire new class of medications, you know, whether it's um, monoclonal antibodies uh, or mRNA vaccines or whatever else new comes down the pipeline, nanoparticles, that's an entirely new domain to explore. So anyways, I hope this uh, video gives you a little bit more hope and optimism about health and longevity over the next few years. Cheers.